Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner of the podcast where we set ourselves on fire and hope that the world comes by to watch us burn. It's a quote from John Wesley. I'm, I'm not a pyromaniac or maybe I am. Who knows? Well, so many of the topics covered here in the Street Preacher's Corner have come, as some of you know, from real life questions or real life situations that arise. And this is one of those days. So uh, here's the context of our discussion. You can see the title. Uh, It was a Wednesday night, and what typically happens on a Wednesday night is I run in the door with about 45 minutes uh, to spare before I run back out the door, get in a vehicle, and uh, drive to the next county to go to church. And this is just the way it's worked out for us. I I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that that lifestyle, uh, but it, it it is what it is. And so this is our habit. This is what we do. We go to church. We go to church Sunday morning. We go to church Sunday night. We go to Wednesday night. We go to special meetings. We go to Bible conferences. We go preach on the street. We go preach. We, we church and church life and and the and and the ministry is is the core and the hub of our life. And we try to plan everything around that. So that includes Wednesday night. So what that means is on Wednesday night, I, like I said, I come in the door. Sometimes I'll get a chance to eat. Sometimes I get a chance to shower. Sometimes something else will have been waiting for me when I get home. Some situation has to be dealt with, and you don't get to do any of those things. And you get back in the car, and you run down the road, and you go to church. So this is one of those nights. So, and and I say this knowing that some of you listening to this know exactly what that's like, because that is also your life and your habit, and and you know you know right where, right where I'm at with that. So this particular Wednesday night, this was a a few weeks back, I've been thinking about the best way to explain all this for a while. <laughs> this particular Wednesday night, I was I was tired. I was I was I was aggravated about one thing or another, and I had just decided uh, I just wasn't going to go. I was going to stay home. I was going to get a shower. I was going to go to bed early, whatever. And I, I'm just going to say this: I don't care how much you enjoy your ministry, and, and I do, and I don't care how much you enjoy church, and I do. There will be days in which you are just you're not mad, you're not bitter, you're not backslid. You just don't want to go. Um, and we're not compelled to go. We're not in a situation where I'm going to be in trouble if I don't go. We're not going to, we're not in a situation where if I don't show up, no one's going to preach. We're not in that situation. So I just, I don't want to go. And uh, so I don't want to go. So this is one of those nights. And I told my wife, I said, look, I'm just going to, I'm just going to stay home. I'm not going. I'm just going to stay home. Well, of course, the more I thought about it in the, you know, 45, 40 minutes or so left, uh, the less I could live with myself. Um, I, after all, I'm the guy that, you know, talks about being, you know, we fight till we drop and we fully rest by the time we hit the ground. I'm the guy that talks about how, you know, we ought to be a, a high speed, low drag, walk, rock hard, watertight, tireless, fearless soldiers for the great warrior King Jesus Christ. I talk about this stuff and I just don't talk about it here. I talk about that stuff in my daily life around my kids. Any of my kids can tell you. This is how I am uh, behind closed doors. And so having having said all that and having lived all that for so long, I say these things because I believe these things. And I didn't want to be the guy who stayed home just because he didn't want to go. Uh, down that path lies treacherous defeat. Because a great chunk of much of life is doing things you don't want to do because they need to be done. Or doing things that need that need that you don't want to do because there is some benefit to yourself or to other people. That is that is that is adulthood. That is life. That is church life. And I just didn't want to be the guy because I know plenty of guys who go. Ah, I don't feel like going, and they don't go, and then they don't go, and they don't go, and pretty soon they're not going at all. And I didn't want to be that. Guy. I don't want to go down that road. And you say, well, you're really overemphasizing something. Well, let me get to where I'm going. So. Yes, I'm at liberty to stay home. Yes, I'm at liberty to do all kind of things. But that doesn't mean that those things are good ideas. Anyway, I decided to go. So I sat, the longer I sat there, the longer I thought, longer I thought about it, the more I felt like just a bum. Just a, a cowardly bum. And so I said, I, that's it. You know, some, I, I don't care if I don't want to go. I'm going to go anyway. Well, my daughter had already announced that she was going to drive. And so when time came to go, um, I just, you know, went and got in the car. Side note, we are almost always late for everything we go to, and it is almost never my fault. I am almost always, 99.999% of the time, I am where I'm supposed to be 
when I'm supposed to be there. I'm sitting in the truck, sitting in the car, waiting on other people. And some of you, you live there too. But anyway, so I, so when time came, I just went and got in the car. So she comes and she gets in the car. She gets in the driver's seat and everything. And she looks in the rear view mirror and she says, uh, she says, I thought you were staying home. And I basically gave her, you know, the Gettysburg address, like I just gave you, you know, rock hard, water tight, high speed, low drag, fight till we drop, fully rested by the time we hit the floor, tireless, restless warriors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, she's heard this all her life and she just rolls her eyes because she thinks her, her dad's a some sort of deranged person that should be dispatched to a lunatic asylum. So, so, so she rolls her eyes and she says, here's, here's the quote, because I wrote it down. What's the big deal? It's only church. Or I'm sorry, what's the big deal? It's just church. Now, that broke my heart a little bit because for her entire life, uh, our policy generally has been that unless you are puking or bleeding from your eyeballs, quit your whining and get in the car. We're going to church. I live by the standard that I make other people live by. And so I make other people live by the standard that I enforce upon myself most of the time. Now, my daughter probably gets more downtime uh, than the boys because, you know, she claims mysterious female elements that my wife assures me are a real thing. And that's the the limit of my curiosity. If you say that that's happening, I sure I'll, I'll, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to I'm not going to investigate any further. Uh, but but. My point was that, and, and, and I did the math, she has, my daughter, has assembled with the saints two or three times a year, easily, between 120, 150 times a year for 16 years. A couple of thousand times, this youngin has met with, a, with, has been involved or been attending at a church service, a couple of thousand times. So I get how it might seem routine to her. But I've done it way more than that, and I've done it for way longer than her. And in that time that I've been uh, uh, attending church or being involved in ministry events of some kind, I have seen, <clears throat> I have seen good things. I have seen bad things. I have seen joy. I have seen heartache. I have seen betrayal. The dumbest things I've ever heard, or ever ever seen in my life, I've seen inside church. Uh, the best. The, I say this whole time. The best and worst nights of my life have been at church. And uh, so, so then, so then, why if all if all of that's true? If I've been there, done that, way more than she has, um, why is it still special to me? Why is it still important to me? And I think because there are some things that I've grasped through Bible reading, through study, through prayer, through ministry, that she hasn't. And I try to talk to her about these things. And if you know my daughter, she's got some things she's got to sort out uh, in her own head spiritually. Um, in her own heart. And so it wasn't really something she was looking to hear. But here we are. You have clicked on this button on purpose. So here we are. So 1 Corinthians 1, uh, starting in verse 10. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind <clears throat> and in the same judgment. Who has been declared unto me of, of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized? In the name of Christ. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, so the 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 uh, the reputation or the the report from the church of Corinth is is that they don't get along. And Paul, using the same phrase used when you cast out devils, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, is what he says. Um, he tells them to get along. Now that that is wild in and of itself. That 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 <clears throat> that they weren't getting along, and that and that Paul commands them to get along. But wait, there's more. So if you jump on down to verse 17, it says, my page turned on its own. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse, jumping on down to verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For do you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, <clears throat> not many noble are called? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. So let me back up, because there's a lot, a lot, lot there. <clears throat> so the context is, okay, let me, so Paul says that God's wisdom is so, uh, let's take a second to sort this out. Paul is telling them to stop squabbling, and in that context, he talks about how God is so much wiser than men, that God's wisdom seems like foolishness to men. People get their axle wrapped around, their brain wrapped around the axle, the idea that God owes men all these answers. And the truth is, God doesn't owe us any answers. And even if he gave you your answers, they wouldn't, you wouldn't understand. <clears throat> and here's proof. Look at what the answers God has given you and look what we do with them. But back up a second. So, so the context is the unity of the church or the unity of the brethren. And Paul gives the cross as an example of God being so far ahead of the game that it doesn't even make sense to men. So, so God, back, 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 way back, Genesis 1, God creates a perfect, sinless world with no sorrow and no sickness and no death and no sin and no death, okay? And the Bible says, when Adam fell, it says, For as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so the death have passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So Adam, in his transgression, brought, us, brought condemnation upon the entire world, and the reason your dog dies and the reason your aunt dies and the reason your flowers die is because there's a sentence of death upon the entire world because of Adam's transgression. He brought death into, there was no death. He brought death into the world. So now death is here and death reigns according to the book of Matthew. And so death reigns and God has to figure out a way to restore his his creation. He did not want a creation with death in it. He wanted a creation with life because he is life. So I say God had to think about it. I mean, you know, God knew all this and whatever. Let's just, just go with me here. So uh, so he has to find a way to, 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 to fix, to, 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 to clear the slate of death. And he can't just dismiss it because it is a natural universe bound, built into the system uh, consequence of what Adam did. The wages of sin is death. It always has been. And if Adam had never sinned, it would still would have been a consequence. If any future person had sinned, the wages of sin would have been death. So, so now that death is in the equation, now that death is part of this, this system that God uh, has in front of him, he has to find a way to fix it. Well, God's not working alone in this problem because men don't like death. Men fear death. And for as long as men have been men, um, they have tried to find ways to get around death. And the best, they, even, you know, the smartest people applying themselves diligently for thousands of years, all they've managed to do is push back death a couple of years. So sometimes, not all the time. So we live to be 80 now instead of dying at 60. Oh, woo hoo you didn't really fix anything. You just pushed it down the road, right? It's like you put a new tire on your car and saying, this will drive forever. No, it won't. It'll wear out too. It just wears out further down the road. You haven't fixed the problem of tires wearing out. You just replaced it with another tire. So, uh, so all that's going on. So, so men have tried to fix this problem, and men haven't managed to fix this problem. And 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 uh, philosophers and scientists and and theologians have have applied themselves uh, from various angles. They've applied themselves to this issue of death. And, and they have come up with nothing. Nothing they've done has improved a lot. One iota. Right now, you got, you know, got uh, guys like, uh, you know, Ray Kurzweil, and, he, and he, he wants to, he wants technology to be a point in which you can upload your consciousness up to a computer and you can, quote unquote, live forever inside this, you know, server farm. Um, there's lots of problems with that. But what that is, that is just one more example of a man trying to cheat death, a man trying to fix the problem of death. And man obviously cannot do it. And so God addresses the problem of death 
by dying. When Jesus Christ yielded himself to death, the Bible says he submitted himself unto death, humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> so, so God deals with death by submitting himself to death and dying and tasting death for every man. And when a righteous man on whom death has no hold submits himself unto death, death breaks. Death is now broken. Death does not work the same way it did before Calvary. You say, well, people still die. Oh, we're getting to that. So death does not work the same way. The Bible says that Jesus has abolished death. And so, uh, so there's no way. With, so we can sit back on this side of it and we can piece it all together. Plus, we have the Holy Spirit uh, instructing us through the, through the Bible what actually going on. But if you're just standing there at Calvary and you're watching the guy you've been following around for three and a half years, you're watching him being mocked and ridiculed and beaten and bleeding out on a cross, there's no way you're looking at that going, yeah, this will fix everything. There's no way you're looking at that. I don't care how spiritual you are. Nobody looked at that and said, oh, this is him fixing the whole thing. This is him resetting the clock from back when Adam messed up. Nobody saw that. And the proof that no one sees that is the fact of how they respond. So when Christ goes to the cross and dies, they, they all scatter. They all come into hiding. And they didn't know and they didn't understand even after they had been told over and over again, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die, after three days I'm going to rise to the dead. He tells them that like half a dozen times, and they still, when it happens, they're still shocked and they're still amazed. It looked like foolishness. It looked like this is not going to fix anything. But what it was, it was the wisdom of God on display, that God understood some aspects and some intricacies to this death problem that you and I didn't. And, in, and, and because of his, his infinite understanding and because of his infinite wisdom, he came up with a solution that not only did not, nobody else think of, but that nobody else understood when it happened. And that is an example. That, that's the example Paul uses when he's talking about the unity of the church and it, it, as, as evidence of that God is smarter than you, so you should get in line with what, get on board with God's program. His evidence he submits to you is the cross. But it doesn't stop there. In that same passage, he says the preaching of the cross is that then that perish foolishness. So, so for from a standpoint of mankind, the guy goes to the cross, he dies, he gets up from the ground or gets up out of the grave, victorious over death, victorious over hell, victorious over sin, makes that makes that victory available to man. And then God, the way God chooses to spread that message is by giving that message, entrusting that message to absolute nobodies it's not what i would have done it's not what you would have done let's say i've used this example before it actually gets funnier with every president let's say we are going to uh as a nation the united states of america we we're going to nuke the moon we we're going to set off a nuclear warhead on the moon for some reason i don't know you know to cover up the secret alien bases on the dark side whatever we're going to do whatever whatever the reason is we're going to nuke the moon and they announced they're going to nuke the moon. Who do you think they would have announced that? Do you think they would bring out the White House janitor? Do you think they'd bring out some poor E one uh, uh, seaman apprentice, uh, you know, stationed on a ship somewhere? No, no. They would. They would bring out the president, or they'd bring out the Secretary of Defense, or they'd bring out some big guy with a bunch of medals on his chest. Because the way men do things is that important messages, important announcements come from important people. And you know they're important because the president's going to hold a press conference. We know something's going to happen. We know Joe Biden's going to walk out there and go, hey, and then wander back off like a Roomba. We know that's going to happen. And we know that what he's saying is theoretically important because he's the one saying it. That's the way people do things. God says, hey, this guy that works at Walmart, I'm going to entrust him with the most important announcement ever. This guy that's got a little lumber yard business, I'm going to entrust him. This little old lady with a bunch of grandkids, I'm going to entrust her. God entrusts nobodies with the most important message ever. It's almost like God wants on purpose to do things differently than us just to, just to prove that his way is better. He didn't write it across the sky. He didn't uh, uh, have angels come down and preach it. He gave it to nobodies. 
And so when you go out on a street corner and you stand there with a Bible and you say, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, people look at you like you're a fool. And, and people have told us for 28 years now, this is not the way to do it. Well, I would tend to agree if, it, if, I, if I was in charge. But God has said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And he's given us the example of the book. So you, have, so you have to do it that way because that's the way God wants it done. And it's his thing. It's not your thing. It's his thing. And if it seems foolish to the people that are listening, that just proves that they don't know what they're talking about. Because God in his wisdom has chosen preaching. You say, Mike, what has any of this got to do with you and your family going to church? Well, just, just hold on. So Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. That is that is an example. I'm just setting the groundwork. Ephesians 2 is where we're going to get into the meat of this thing. Setting the groundwork of how God does things differently than you. And God thinks about things differently than you and I. And God's ways are right. And your ways and my ways are wrong. Foolishness to him. Wisdom to us. You take a guy like Socrates or a guy like Plato or guy, you know pick your pick your favorite philosopher Kant or or a, a Kierkegaard or 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 uh, any of those guys, Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy. You pick, take your pick, and the smartest things they've ever said are already found in the Book of Proverbs, and everything else they've said is just background noise. Ephesians 2. Sorry, I don't need to get on my soapbox about... Uh, actually, I actually do own a soapbox, by the way. Uh, Ephesians 2. Let's see. Start about verse 11. Wherefore, and remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you're without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, he who are sometimes are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. That he, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, <clears throat> and whom all the building fitly framed together, Growth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you have also built it together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So let me let me just talk about what's going on there, without chasing too much of it down. <clears throat> so God looks down at lost humanity, right? So mankind is separated from God by sin. Our iniquities have hid His face from us. Our transgressions have, have, you know, all that stuff. We're separated from God by our sin, but we're also separated from each other by our culture, by our ling languages, by our habits, by our customs. There are people on this planet that I, I almost have nothing in common with other than the fact that we're both humans and we're both sinners. There are people that are living on such a different world than I am, a different culture than I am. It's, 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 it's amazing that we're even on the same planet. You take my life and you compare it to somebody who is living uh, in, in, in the hills of Pakistan as part of a tribe. They are literally living the same way their ancestors did in the 13th century. And I am living completely differently than my ancestors did in the 13th century. And so we're on the same planet at the same time, but we have nothing. If we got together and talked, where do we even begin? Because our worlds are so different. Well, God looked at an entire planet like that. And he wanted to reconcile all things unto himself. And so in his wisdom, he goes to the cross, he dies, and the Bible says when he died on the cross, he slew the enmity that, that, that was between us and him. He also slew the enmity that we have between each other. On this planet, let me, give, let me give you an example, because as an American, it's not always easy to think of a good example that, that we can relate to. If you go to the Philippines right now, if you go to, to, uh, to Mindanao in the Philippines, uh, you know, 70, 80 years ago, um, the Japanese paid those guys a little visit. 
And they did horrible things to the Filipinos because the Japanese, when they go to war, they're absolute monsters. And so they did horrible, tragic, cruel things to the Filipinos just as just because that's what they do to people they conquer traditionally. And so here we are. Uh, you can have you can have a saved Filipino. And you can have a save Japanese guy. And those, if you go back, if you take those two individuals, those two men, you trace their history back, their grandfathers killed each other. Their grand, one guy's grandfather raped the other guy's grandmother. One, you know, there's all this oppression, there's all this blood, there's all this bad blood, there's all this feud, and there's all this, all this that went on through history. And God looks at all that. And so he takes those people out of those tribes that hated each other and spent decades and centuries killing each other and oppressing each other. And he takes those guys and he pulls them out of the tribe they're in. They're not, they're, I mean, they are Filipino, but they're not. They are Japanese, but they're not. There's something else. In addition to being Japanese, in addition to being Japanese, uh, Filipino, in addition to being American, they are something else. There's something bigger than that nationality. There's something bigger than being a Choctaw Indian. There's something bigger than being some white guy. So he takes them out of the family they were born in and he puts them in his family. And he tells you that animosity that you had culturally and histor historically and traditionally that you had with that tribe, with that guy, with that, that fell over there. I killed that at the cross. And now I command you to get along with that guy. Okay. So even in even in uh, our situation here, uh, where you know I don't go to I don't go to uh, church with people. Well, I do. I go to church with Yankees, and Yankees came down here, you know, 180 years ago or so, and killed my ancestors, and oppressed my ancestors. And so uh, you say, well, that doesn't matter. Well, it matters to some people. Um, you know, it mattered to the people that it happened to, and it mattered to the, their descendants, and it's kind of a big deal to me. But if that person, if that Yankee is saved, then then God slew the enmity between us. And I can't be mad about something that God killed. I mean, I could be, but I'd be wrong. So you're going to go to church with people, not only that there was a history there, maybe, maybe culturally, traditionally, historically, a history there of, of, of bloodshed and violence and, and, and just plain meanness. But you're also going to go to church with people who are, who are lunkheads and who are boneheads and who do stupid stuff and who say stupid stuff. And say things and hurt your feelings and betray your trust and do horrible things still. And so God commands you through the local church. And God enables you through the local church and through the power of the Holy Spirit. He enables you to get along with people and to have fellowship with people and to love people and to back up people and to care for people and to be a family to people that you wouldn't have give the time of day. You wouldn't spit on them if they were on fire out in your old life. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm not stretching the text here. I'm taking the text. I'm applying it to what's happening. If you're saved and you're in a church right now, you got somebody that's all just, it gets on your nerves sometimes. And the Bible tells you to love that guy like a brethren and have his back. And don't squabble with him because you squabbling is foolishness. And God in his wisdom says, don't be squabbling. And God in his wisdom has joined you and that guy together. You are joined to that guy. You are joined to every saved person that ever has been. Every saved person ever will be in some way that we don't even understand. This, there's, this bit, there's, there's not a body of Christ for every generation. There's one body of Christ. And even though we can't all meet at the same place, we meet in little groups of the body of Christ. But I'm joined to to. I'm joined to the guy in the prison camp in North Korea not right now. We are members one of another. And when the opportunity presents itself to do good to that man, I'm supposed to do it. Why? Because he's my kin now. Jesus Christ has made us kin. Okay? But on a practical sense, the, the practical way in which you're going to see this play out and work out in your life is by getting off your blessed assurance and going and assembling with the saints and talking to them and befriending them and pouring your life into them the same way Paul, Paul, Paul there's a quote in one of the epistles where Paul says, I'm willing to spend and be spent for you. 
that's the attitude you're supposed to have, not only to Christians in general, but specifically to the guy sitting two pews in front of you. And if you guys aren't getting along, you're not right with God. And you're not displaying the wisdom of God. But, it, but there's more to this than just that. I mean, that's remarkable in itself. That God gathers us from all these different tribes and tongues and nations and makes us one and joins us to another and slays the enmity that we had between each other. The context in Ephesians 2 is the enmity between Jew and Gentile, but it applies to every to Gentile against Gentile, Jew against German, you know, you know, Filipino against Japanese, Yankee against rebel. I mean, I mean, people go to war with each other. That's what people have been doing since Genesis 3. And God says, no, I've made you into something different. I've made you into something better. You need to not be squabbling amongst each other. And so if you got issues at church, you got to sort them out. You owe it to God to sort them out. And if you don't sort them out, if you hold on to them, if you stay bitter about it, then you are in disobedience to the scriptures. Okay, fine. And if you stay home because you don't feel like putting up with these people, then you are in disobedience to the scriptures. Okay, but wait. There's more. Continue on in Ephesians 3. So you don't think I'm, I'm jumping the track here too, too far here. Verse 8 says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed uh, in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we just take that text at face value, here's the scene. God is on his throne in all his glory. All that stuff you read about in Revelation 4 and Ezekiel 1 that's happening is happening right there around around the throne and there are conversations going on and there are things being pointed out and God who made all who made the sun and made the stars and made the moon and made everything that's around him made everything that is he made it he is having conversations apparently with principalities and powers right now in heavenly places I mean that's verse 10 those conversations are going on right now and in those conversations when God wants to display to this entity, whatever he's speaking to, could be the devil, could be foul spirits, it could be angelic host, could be anything that's up there. When he wants to manifest his wisdom, when he wants to show up, when God wants to brag about his power and what he can pull off, what he points to is not the sun, the moon, the stars. He points to the church. And he says, look at what I did. He says, I made those guys get along. Their ancestors were killing each other and burning their villages to the ground. And look at them, they're embracing his brothers and they're sending money and they're helping each other out. And they're, they're, they're laboring together in my vineyard in the field of, the, of preaching the gospel. I did that. They couldn't have done it for themselves because for thousands of years, all they did was kill each other. I fixed that. I didn't compel them. I taught them. And I enabled them. And that's my manifold wisdom. Multifaceted, uh, constantly unfolding wisdom of God is revealed in you and in me. And we are the subject of conversation in heaven when we, when we unify and when we assemble together and when we put aside our differences and we bury the hatchet and we, and we go forward for Jesus Christ. We are a source of God's bragging rights. So you see, it's not just church. That was her comment. It's just church. It's not just church. One of the most important things going on on the planet, from God's perspective, is going on when you assemble with other saints. Now that is wild. Because it does seem very routine. It does seem like, well, we checked a box. We did another service. But when you go after church, you go, hey, man, how you been? How's your family been? 
Oh, you know, the wife was a little, little bit down, but she's, she's getting better now. Oh, okay, well, good to hear. We've been praying for you. Anything else you guys need? No, we're doing good. We're doing good. When you do that, as simple as that seems, as routine as that seems, that is God's wisdom on display and God's power on display and God's up in heaven going, look at that. Look at those guys. I mean, those guys would have beat each other's brains out with beer bottles when they were lost. And look at them. Yeah, I mean, it's wild stuff. So what you ought to do is you ought to get off your sorry behind and find you a place somewhere where the Bible is taught, where the saints assembled, and where you can labor together with those people. Because without that, you are not you are not going to be all you can be. You you know, um, um, where's it? At? Ephesians five, maybe. Uh, trying to find it on the fly here. Nah, I don't know where it's at. It lists all the all the all the. Uh, you know, evangelists and, 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 and uh, uh, teachers and, and pastors and, and evangelists and <coughs> give them for the, for the perfecting the saints, for the edifying of the body. Where, where that verse is at? And uh, there we go. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So God gives you other believers to perfect you and to grow you and to develop you. And so if you don't avail yourself of that, you'll never be all you can be for Jesus. And you'll be in disobedience and you won't be cited as an example of God's wisdom and of God's power in heavenly places. It's something to think about. It's something to think about on the days when you don't want to go. Uh, You should tell yourself, I need to charge the hill one more time, and once I'm there, I need not just sit like a bump on a log and ignore everybody and say I've checked a box. I need to be involved. I need to be part of this. I need to treat these people like they're my family. I need to be concerned for them. I need to be broken for them. I need to be praying for them. I need to be giving money to them if they need it, because that's what you do. That's how God shows his power in your life, and that's how God, God grows you. That's how God perfects you. So there you go. I am not one of those street preachers that is against the local church. I am a street preacher that is very much in favor of the local church because the Bible is very in favor of the local church. And if you're in a bad church situation, well, uh, that's a subject for another time, but you should figure out a solution because life is too short to go to a bad church. Okay. All right. Well, this is it. That's what I'm gonna. That's where I'm gonna stop off. I actually have to go inside and get finished up and uh, get ready for church. Uh, you're not hearing this at the same time that it's being recorded. Let's just put it that way. And so thank you for listening, all four of you. And, uh, you know, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, whatever. Um, yeah, this is Michael. This has been the Street Preacher's Corner. Thank you for listening. And I will see you on the other side.